about our brass, James. Just run. Have you? <laughs> Yeah, so watch that. My hair's alright, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's alright. Yeah, I was thinking you, <laughs> you just know, had a haircut. I had a sharp haircut. What happened to yeah. the hair and makeup in that one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, <laughs> didn't want to wear a tie. Strictly no comment. No, we had an interesting afternoon, didn't we? So it was, it was good. Current. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really good. Really interesting. Yeah. I don't um, remember, but I see her stuff on LinkedIn. Yeah. It's like the only access I have. Yeah, she's very visible. Um, anyway. Dario, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, episode 17, Taking Stock After the Bell. We're very pleased to be joined by, uh, as per usual, James Hughes, Portage of Investment Management. More importantly, however, Daria <laughs> Perkins. <laughs> Far more importantly. <laughs> <laughs> Dario, we've, been, we've been really excited. We have, this, yeah. Haven't we? Yeah. Daria is a. That's just too much. Too much <laughs> <laughs> Dario is Managing Director at TS Lombard, the um, economics consultancy covering a wide range of global macroeconomic themes and writes a fortnightly macro picture, which James and I are keen students of. Uh, Dario has extensive experience as economist, having worked with the Treasury under Gordon Brown, uh, and latterly, following the financial crisis, uh, at the Bank of England, um, working on some of their macro prudential um, framework post the uh, financial crisis. Um, Before that, Dario worked as an economist at ABN Ambro, uh, is an AC Milan fan and a uh, keen Twitterer, and in fact coined the phrase a year or so ago, the moron premium following the uh, the guilt crisis and the Liz Trust and budget. And hasn't been able to live it down. And hasn't lived it down and, and, and lives on and has been spotted on Twitter today, no less. It's, so, it's uh, kind of sad that, you know, you, you do this job for 20 odd years and that's your legacy. That's your legacy. You know, yeah. a throwaway comment that you made while trying to avoid eye contact with other parents at my daughter's ballet lesson. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is it still called tweeting or is it Xing now? Or kissing, I, I call it or, Twitter. I think, think it'll always be Twitter, I think, in my eyes. <laughs> I think we'll call it the app formerly known as Twitter. Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, we've got quite a lot to talk about because, as we sort of alluded to um, before we before we press go, the world is a quite an interesting place, both from a, I guess, from a cyclical perspective. Where are we in the business cycle, if that's a thing? Um, why haven't we had a recession yet? Yeah. Um, and 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 secondly, more importantly, which has been a bit of a theme of the podcast for the last few months, really, is you know, are we at an inflection point? We've had ten years. Basically, our careers, um, despite James looking nearly sixty, most of our careers has <laughs> been <laughs> in, uh, has been That's zero really interest good. rates, low inflation, slow growth, QE, yeah. and we've had the pandemic, and we are now seemingly in a higher inflation, slightly more volatile, higher nominal growth, yeah. higher debt world. And I think we'll we'll come on to talk a little bit about that, you know, perhaps a little bit later on. But I think the big question in the short term here is um, we've got a chart up of. Um, US Fed funds rate in red at five and a quarter percent, uh, two and 10 year US government bond yields. You know, the stark thing to note here is how they've gone from basically zero to five percent in the space of 18 months and two years. Um, yet the economy on both sides of the Atlantic, to be fair, appears to be humming along mm. quite nicely. And in one of our one of our first episodes, we discussed, are we going to have a recession? And we all pretty much said yes, because how can you take rates from 0 to 5% and the economy yeah. not fall over? So we've also got an inverted yield curve here, which is slightly technical, which we might not get into. But you know, essentially, when short-term borrowing costs are higher than long-term borrowing costs, you know, historically, as the chart shows, whenever we've had an inverted yield curve in the last 40, 50 years, it's always been followed by recession. Um, well, an uninverted yield curve. An first, uninverted, or the, right? the uninversion of the yield curve. <laughs> There's yeah. only a sample of five, though. Sample of size, <laughs> and, and, and e, n equals five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's get the stats in. Um, but I guess the first question is, you know, why haven't we had a recession? And if we haven't had it so far, are we going to have it? Um, see, I was writing something slightly different 18 months ago. I was saying we were going to have a fake recession scare. Mm. So the idea was that I thought people were misreading this cycle because it hasn't been a cycle. You know, but I sort of get frustrated with people saying, where are we in the cycle? Because, you know, this isn't a cycle. I mean, we shut down the global economy. We reopened it, caused a huge amount of chaos, sent inflation up to sort of half century highs. Mm. Um, None of that was sort of organic. You know, none of that was a normal business cycle. And so investors who were using traditional business cycle rules to try and figure out where we were, were misled Mm. and the biggest one was leading indicators because Mm. you know the the thing that made people so bearish 12 months ago is that all of these leading indicators suddenly started to turn down sure but what is in that leading indicator it's usually it's two-thirds manufacturing so if you just take a step back and you think well 
what you know what has been the nature of this economy over the last three years we basically had a period where we were all at home locked down mm. buying stuff off the internet right so we had a huge manufacturing boom we had a huge increase in world trade you know that was the nature of the pandemic economy yeah and then they eased those restrictions they reopened the economy and we pivoted into something else we pivoted into services into hospitality and go travel. Yeah. and so you were always going to have a manufacturing recession. You know, mm. That was inevitable. You couldn't mm. avoid that. You know, it, it was a bit like the sort of Second World War where you'd been building all of these machinery and yeah. artillery and, yeah. you know, and then so you had a recession on the other side of that. So you're always going to have that. But the big thing about that was is that the spending was going somewhere else. And so we had, you know, a very strong service sector. And the big thing about services is that is demand for labour. And so you had a very resilient, strong labour market and we had huge labour shortages everywhere. And what the whole discussion about recession forgot is that recession is not an event. You know, you don't define recession by mm. two quarters of negative GDP. Mm. It's meaningless. Recession is a process mm -hmm. and it's a process that happens in the labour market. So you start to fire people. People start to lose their jobs. That goes back into confidence and spending. That hits corporate revenues. Mm -hmm. That leads to more rounds of redundancies. Mm -hmm. That is your recessionary process. We haven't had that anywhere in the world over the past two years because that's just not the economy that we've been in. So the leading indicators were wrong. The manufacturing stuff was a complete head fake. Uh, and so do you, do you think the then bond, that the yield bonds, curve... Well, I think that was heavily influenced by uh, the industrial cycle. Right. Because yeah. that always drives, you know, that sort of... Uh, the sort of sentiment in bonds is heavily driven by very cyclical indicators mm -hmm. like um, like the PMIs. Yeah. Uh, but the spending was going somewhere else. So and so and the other thing about that sort of fake recession is that we'd been through this enormous drag on real incomes. You know, we had inflation hitting sort of forty year highs. Mm. Wages weren't really growing very much. So you had this huge squeeze on consumers. Mm. But going into this year, that squeeze was beginning to fade. Mm. So actually, we've, we were starting, we've, got the, we've got the chart here. Yeah, so we were starting to get wages. a recovery in real wages. Mm. And so people were fixated on the excess savings and this idea that people had accumulated savings, these savings were about to run out. But the other perspective there was that people were running down their savings because their real incomes were being squeezed and they were trying to protect their spending yeah, power. Yeah, of course, yeah. So we've now got to a situation where the excess savings have either gone or not gone, depending on how you define them, because the whole thing was sort of flawed, but we won't go into that. <laughs> and then, so you've lost that support. So consumers are no longer willing to run down their savings rate, but they don't need to because their real incomes are beginning to rise again. So a big recessionary drag is beginning to fade. The other part of this fake recession is that uh, people were using the Phillips curve and they were saying, you know, we've got really high inflation, We've got really low unemployment. So the only way to get inflation down is we're going to have to have a recession. Unemployment mm. is going to have to go up. But what they were missing is that we had massive amounts of labor shortages everywhere. We had job vacancies at sort of the highest levels mm. since the 40s after the Second World War. And so we did have very aggressive monetary tightening, as you showed on the chart. But we had um, we were destroying demand for labor in a different way. We weren't putting people out of work. We were destroying a demand for workers that hadn't actually been realized yeah. because companies wanted to take on staff to meet this demand, but they couldn't because they couldn't find the staff. And, so, and the services is different to manufacturing, isn't it? You know, if you've got an order to make some widgets, yeah. you will make the widgets eventually if there's a delay. But yeah. if I want to go and get a coffee, but I can't because there's only one person serving at Nero because I haven't got enough staff and there's a yeah. queue out the door, that is demand unmet, isn't it? That's not like I don't exactly. wait for three months to get my coffee. So, so, the, so, so you had, to your point that, you, um, you know, you're destroying unmet demand as opposed exactly. to, you know, just destroying demand. For so nobody on net loses their job. Mm. And that's been, you know, the theme of this year. You know, there has been demand destruction. I think monetary policy has had an effect on the economy. Uh, I think you see that in labour markets, but you see it in quite a subtle way. And, you know, when everyone was looking at the Phillips curve, I was arguing, well, how about we look at history here? Because mm. there is a period that looks very similar to this. We had a, a sort of fake mm. cycle. We had lots of pent up demand. We had massive supply side um, disruption. And that was the period after the Second World War. You know, that period, uh, sort of 1946, 1947. In many ways, the economy looked like the post pandemic economy. We had a massive increase in inflation. But it wasn't the start of some sort of wage price spiral. 
it was basically a, a one-off shift in the price level. Yeah. So, you know, prices in the UK rose 40%. They rose 20% in the US. And monetary policy wasn't allowed to respond to that because it would have been unpatriotic to raise interest rates <laughs> you know, when you had this big debt servicing. And so um, the inflation came down by itself. So you had immaculate disinflation, that phrase that's been so popular yeah. this year. And so I think the economy has, has always looked much more similar to that sort of distorted post-World War II economy than anything you get that from... Everyone likes to compare. Well, the 70s was a complete yeah. head fake, yeah. Uh, and so I think, you know, instead of using the business cycle or using the 1970s, they should have been using that sort of, you know, that post-World War that II post period. And but if you're a central banker, you know, you, you were just obsessed with the 1970s because yeah. that was your whole reason that was your for being. Yeah. You know, that was why you were there. Yeah, and we've got the chart of inflation here, which um, was in one of your recent notes going back to 1901. So I don't think many of us remember those periods, but the, <laughs> the Second World War period is there marked, isn't it? And and, and it yeah. was a sort of transitory period, um, yeah. if you like, um, compare and contrast that to the, to the spike in the 70s, which was more longer lived. So you know, do you therefore expect that this time around we get a sort of immaculate disinflation and have central banks absolutely nailed it? Or do you think they've think, probably gone too far? And that I think that, uh, I think we have had a lot of immaculate disinflation. The inflation has come down much more quickly than people expected. Mm. Um, there's a lot of stuff from the BIS about the difficult last mile of getting to 2%. Mm. But I don't think central banks really want to get to 2% anyway. I think if they get to 3 that's probably good enough. They just won't admit it. Inflate mm. some debt away as well. Yeah. And and I think that, um, you know, we, we we keep getting journalists saying to central bankers, are you going to tolerate higher inflation? You know, why don't you raise mm. your inflation target to 3%? I don't know what answer they yeah. expect Why, why to would get they even ask? Why, 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 why is Jay Powell going to go, actually, <laughs> we get to 3 we'll be all right. Well, we'll knock Lagarde you on the head. Almost, Lagarde almost. <laughs> Lagarde almost did it. <laughs> she yeah. said, well, we'll review it at some point. Yeah. But, um, you know, no central bank is going to be honest. You know, the, the fact is, if you could get through this, this mm. sort of post-pandemic economy and it doesn't turn into the 1970s and you get three, three and a half percent inflation and a soft landing, that's a fantastic outcome. Mm. You know, 18 months ago, these guys thought they were going to become the biggest jokers in history. Mm. You know, they were imagining this scenario in their heads where... It wasn't just that it was the 1970s, and you know we all know that central bankers messed up in the 1970s, but it was they'd done it again with the 1970s as a template. Yeah, and and all those economists are trained in the shadow of the. If you look at their sort of demographics exactly. and their ages, they they trained in the shadow of the 70s. So they're all so taught in print on you know, their about brain, this isn't big it? monetary failure in the 1970s. Uh, you know, Arthur Burns is this sort of. You know, comedy figure. He's a caricature, isn't it? <laughs> you know? and, and I think that if you were Jay Powell or Lagarde or Bailey, you're thinking, oh, my God, in 40 years time, they're still going to be talking about me. Mm. You know, the joker mm. that let inflation get away yeah. a second time. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that the fact that you get to something like three is actually a really good outcome, given that you thought you were facing this sort of nightmare scenario. Mm. But you can't admit it. You can't say that 3% inflation is acceptable. So mm. you have to keep peddling the line. No, it's going to be two. We have to be two. Because, you know, because if you change your inflation target once you're you're missing it, mm. you know, then you effectively don't have one anymore. And I think the consensus was that all of these central <coughs> banks probably would have raised their inflation targets to 3% back in 2019. Because yeah. it would have been aspirational. You know, you're trying really hard to get inflation up to that level. Well, if you do it now... You're admitting defeat. You're yeah. saying we can't hit that target because it's too hard. So what happens if three percent is too hard as well? Mm. Well, the, the Fed brought in average inflation targeting, didn't they? That was yeah. 2020, 2021. That was right at the start of the pandemic. right at the start of the pandemic. So on the, on that basis, they should be over tightening now because we've had a period where inflation's been well above that two percent. Mm. Yeah. So but therefore, their average that. inflation <laughs> target that means they need to be below two percent now. And, and depends right. when you start the average. <laughs> well, of course, well, uh, well, fund managers, we're very good at starting, <laughs> picking, picking our dates to suit a narrative. Trust me. Um, it was never, it was, you know, it was never particularly clear, but it was, no. it was, I think the, the sort of asymmetry was they prepared to take chances with the labour market. They prepared to run the labour market. Off, so, and that's sort of why they fell behind the curve. So do you think there was the need to raise rates as much as they have? Or do you think they've tightened <laughs> I think, too far? I think that from their sort of personal perspective, you know, their sort of 
risk management or ask covering as somebody called it on mm. Twitter. From that perspective, they had to be very aggressive in the end. They had to show that they were serious. Mm. Um, if they had been less aggressive, I think they probably would have got a very similar, very similar outcome. result. Yeah. I mean, you and I talked about the demand destruction in labor markets, yeah. Yeah. but the lucky part of that is that the the big sort of excess labor demand was in the sectors that were sort of most exposed to the pandemic distortions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we may have had that demand destruction anyway, just as the economy sort of rebalanced towards. So I don't think they need to be that aggressive. I worry that um, they got sort of whipsawed by this cycle. And I think that's a bigger issue in Europe because if there's a case of central banking, central banks over tightening, yeah. I think the ECB and the <clears throat> Bank of England have done a much better job of over tightening yeah. than mm. the Fed because um, they started with an economy that was already weaker. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the boom. We didn't have the consumer boom here. And the impact of monetary tightening has been much bigger because we have a lot more short-term debt, a lot more variable rate mortgages. There's a much bigger squeeze on corporates that's coming from this. So I think you've taken an economy that was already weaker than the US and you've imposed a much bigger monetary tightening on that economy. And to me, the, the issue with monetary tightening and the recession risk was almost, it was always about whether central banks would just go too far and raise interest rates too rapidly if they would get whipsawed by this fake cycle. And I think that the European central banks have been whipsawed more than the Fed. More. So then you get to this dilemma mm. where, you know, partly because they were so obsessed with their currencies and they, you know, remember the reverse currency war, all yep. of that nonsense yep. last year where they almost felt they had to match the Fed one for one with the hawkishness to stop the currencies from going down and making the inflation worse. We, we now have a sort of another dilemma, which is the Fed has stopped. These central banks at some point will probably need to start cutting interest rates. Mm -hmm. And will they be able to if the US is still so still resilient humming along. and the Fed is still? Yeah. So there's a bit of a dilemma there for them. Mm. But I think they've probably overdone it already in mm. Europe. But to come back to your, your your question about what has changed, you know, I, I've been big on the sort of fake cycle and, you know, the, all of that stuff and the, the, and the distortions. But I think that um, if you look at big turning points in what I call the macro super cycle, there are always some historic event. Mm. So, uh, you know, the Bank of England had this really good study back in 2017 looking at what they called real rate reversals, you know, these big changes from periods where interest rates have been very depressed for a decade or more, and you suddenly had this big reversal. And you look through the list, and they didn't label them, but I went back through sort of history trying to look up all the dates and figure out what was happening. And it was basically, you know, wars, pandemics, famines, any sort of big historic event. Mm. Now, I think it's pretty clear we've been living through some big historic events over the last three years. You know, not just the pandemic, um, you know, pandemics is one of those sort of markers, yeah. but also um, the geopolitics. Mm. You know, we, we effectively now have a cold war between the US and China. Mm. We have a hot war in Europe. We have, you know, big geo geopolitical split between NATO and Russia and Russia's allies. And I think that when you look back on this, this period, you're going to say, actually, things were beginning to change. You know, th th there are these big geopolitical changes. I think deglobalization is real. You know, I think that's something that is gaining traction. Yeah, yeah we've, got a, uh, we've got a chart here, which is one from one of your notes. On yeah, so we, a, we went through one index. wave of deglobalization. Mm. Yeah, and actually, if you look at that chart, I mean, that period um, towards the end of the 1800s, before the pandemic, I was writing notes saying, this is, there are some really eerie similarities here. Mm. Because, you know, the sort of neoliberalism um, of the sort of post-Reagan Thatcher era, we basically recreated that economy. You know, massive polarization, uh, stagnant wages, mm -hmm. inequality. And we were beginning to see the political shift. So if you think about my, my super cycles, you basically have three super cycles. You have one, which is sort of 1850, which is the beginning of modern capitalism, to the First World War. And that is the complete dominance of capital over labor. So, you know, that was rapid deglobalization, rapid technological change. Um, you, you you had kids working in factories. You know these, it was that sort of level of repeal of the corn laws and the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you had the sort of big sort of corporate. Uh, yeah. I've forgotten what it's called in the US. They had a name for it. And um, and you, you start to get a political reaction to that. And so towards the end of the eighteen hundreds, eighteen nineties, you begin to get the first populist parties. Mm -hmm. 
you get the first, the people were worried we were going to have this sort of Marxist revolution. It was the Engels pause. Uh, and you began to get these big, these big shifts in the, in the politics. Mm. So we had the first trade unions, the first welfare state, uh, the first protectionist measures, the beginning of the first wave of deglobalization. And then we had the two world wars. And then we emerged from the second world war and we just had this completely different economy. We have what they called a mixed economy. You know, it's this sort of balance between um, between labor and capital, between mm -hmm. you know government and and the private sector, and that was that was an economy that prioritized full employment and prioritized you know wages mm -hmm. instead of just low interest rates and and growth mm -hmm. for the capitalist, and you know that worked pretty well until the seventies mm -hmm. when it got to an extreme. You know, we had a, we had a secular slowdown in productivity. And the 1970s was basically uh, a, a sort of midlife crisis. It was this sort <laughs> of it was this sort of cultural war, you know, between labour and capital. Yeah. It was about who would bear the cost of this productivity slowdown, and you had very powerful trade unions balanced by very powerful corporates and governments, mm -hmm. and that's what gave you those wage price spirals. You know, I think inflation is basically about power, and when you have that sort of power conflict, that's when you get these these sort of wage price spirals. So then, you know, we end up in the extreme, you know, when labor is in charge in that way, you always end up with sort of high inflation. Um, when capital is in charge, you always end up with financial imbalances mm -hmm. and, you know, mm. and asset price bubbles because sure. you get very low interest rates. Yeah. And then we had, you know, Thatcher comes in and you get Reaganomics in the, in the US and we take that economy and we basically destroy it. You know, we, we destroy the trade unions, we create mass unemployment. Mm. You know, these central bankers today talking about how they need to do a Volcker, they forget about the politics of the early mm. 80s. You know, we had 15 years where the economy clearly didn't work and everyone accepted that it didn't work. Mm. Three so there was an enormous and, amount of tolerance for pain. Yeah. You know, these central banks, they start to cause a recession. They're going to be under enormous pressure to do something about it. Very well, I mean, quickly. Panorama last night. I don't know if you saw it on BBC. It'll be on iPlayer, but we're recording yeah. this on Tuesday. And Panorama last night was about the mortgage crisis pain coming through, and it was yeah. nothing more than a couple of three or four case studies of households. And it's funny about you, and the government's well, giving support. The pain, the pain's yeah. not there. The pain's not the, really the pain's there. Not there yet. Yet. But you, you saw it in the pandemic. There's talk about sort of bailouts, bailouts, for, yeah, yeah, for mortgages, yeah. and, you, and yeah. Europe too. You know, you look at the most flexible mortgage rates in in Europe is Portugal. And already the government is looking for ways to contain this. Pain. Mm. So there's no tolerance for that pain as there was in the in the early 80s. Mm. And so that sort of set this new super cycle, which was the neoliberal super cycle, which was deglobalization, destroy the trade unions, rapid immigration, open up product markets, open up financial markets. And that was all fine until the global financial crisis, because you know you end up where you always end up, a massive credit bubble that bursts. Mm. And then for a decade, Nobody knew what to do. You know, there was no alternative to, you know, we had austerity in the UK. And mm. to me, austerity was sort of neoliberalism overplaying its hand. You know, it, that was the only solution mm. they could come up with. And you could do that in the sort of no Napoleonic era, but you yeah. couldn't do it in a modern economy and expect yeah. to get away with it. So that long decade of, you know, very little growth, rising inequality, sort of hollowing out of the North again, you get a political reaction to mm. that. And you started to see that with, you know, Brexit, Brexit and Trump, Trump and Corbyn and all of that stuff. You know, that was the mm. politics beginning to shift again. The yeah. populist parties. Kind of then we have yeah. the pandemic and already there's a private incentive to change supply chains. You know, we have companies that are, you know, big in the, in the logistics industry and they tell us they're just having sort of radical discussions about how to change supply chains. So you had the private incentive and now you have the sort of, uh, the government incentive as well with this sort of geopolitics and strategic Chips industrial Act and policy and inflation and, reduction Act and in all the states of that and stuff. all that. Yeah, and yeah. So <clears throat> my point is that when you look at this, you can see it that there's a different type of economy that's emerging from this because this isn't neoliberalism anymore. Mm. You know, we want governments to play a bigger role. We have fiscal, you know, policy mm. going wild. We have industrial policy. You know, if I said at the Treasury in the late 90s, maybe we should try some strategic industrial policy. They would have kicked me out. Mm. You know, it's, it, don't pick winners was the yeah. philosophy. Well, now, you know, the US is doing it. China's doing it. And now Europe's going to have to do it because it's seeing its its car industry get mm. completely decimated. We've seen some news in that in the last few days, haven't we? Something, some sort of yeah. plan to underwrite the car industry in Europe. 
So they're gonna we're they're gonna have the money to do away it. from HS2, haven't we? Well, yeah, we were, you've peppered it around <laughs> everywhere else. <laughs> nice one, guys. Um, so, so I think that it's it's quite subtle, but I think that you can see that super cycle is beginning to turn mm. because you know neoliberalism is in retreat, and we we basically have a government that sees a different role for itself in the economy, and that's what turns it. But you know we don't just jump into the 1970s. You know you can't recreate the economy. <laughs> from 50 mm. years ago in 18 months. So it's a very gradual process, mm. it's very subtle, and I think it's beginning to show up in bond markets. You know, I think bond investors are starting to think, well, maybe something has actually changed over the last three years. Maybe we're not going back to zero rates and QE. And that, you know, and I, I think it's subtle. So when I think about this, I think about the prevailing tendency of inflation. So for 20 years, 2% inflation was basically a, a ceiling on yep. inflation. You know, we, we were constantly trying to get inflation up to 2%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I think we're in a world where 2% inflation is a floor. So, you know, you can't get inflation below that. And in fact, the prevailing tendency is always going to be inflation threatening to break higher. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, profoundly different to, for investors. Well, if we come back to that point about globalization and yeah. China and technology to a degree, that what we've basically had is 30 years where the price of stuff has gone down because yeah. of outsourced manufacturing textiles to subcontinent pcs computers cars yeah. etc to china and that that has pushed down headline inflation quite yeah. materially particularly in the uk yeah but if you now going into you know you talked about cold wars hot wars the end of just in time manufacturing supply yeah. chains re-migrating on top of inflation reduction now chips act you know we talked about it a few times you know you don't get zero goods price inflation for the next 10 years in all yeah. likelihood you probably get two or three which if you slap it on top of services inflation, which always runs at 2 or 3% or whatever the number is, yeah. you're right. You you know, your 2% is no longer a ceiling. It's probably yeah. a floor and it's probably 3 to 5 to 6. And maybe those changes in the bond market well, that we've seen are, yeah, I think you're right. Maybe bond markets the, are waking up Well, the that. big thing is, I think, volatility. So, you know, that great moderation that we have is, is gone. I mean, I can't imagine a world where inflation is as stable mm. over the next five years as it has been. You know, over the previous twenty. Yeah, well, I mean, to come back, come back to the hundred-year chart on inflation. I mean, you, you know, the last thirty years since eighty-one, um, yeah. it, it looks an anomaly Flat compared line. to the eighty years before, right? Yeah, and you know why? Because we had super efficient supply chains. We had this string of um, you know nice supply shocks, mm. nice in the sense that they helped with inflation. Um, but you know, the politics that has sort of been mm. bubbling. You know, under the surface, it's quite dangerous. And I think you know, even if you <coughs> if you just accept that climate change is real, it doesn't have to even be man made at this mm. point. But if it's real, you know, that alone will give you more volatile inflation because we're going to get more Food severe price weather. Yeah. We're going to get more commodity price shocks. Yeah. You know, and that alone will give you a series of supply shocks. Mm. Now, if governments also try to do something about that, we're going to have you know green bottlenecks. We're going to put enormous pressure on. On commodity prices so again you know any scenario here is more volatile inflation and that's before you get into things like you know you start messing up supply chains because you're deglobalizing, or you start having you know messy geopolitics so you know think the last you know few weeks where we've had this big with a big increase in the oil price and yeah. again you know with the middle east uh it's it's just not a friendly geopolitical environment mm -hmm. anymore so you're going to get this sort of you know, jiggery pokery from mm. politicians all over the world, yeah. causing disruption and causing volatility. But presumably, part of deglobalization for the UK could be quite positive because we've talked for a long time about the UK doesn't really manufacture anything yeah. anymore. It's just yeah. service led. Um, you know, there's a lot. There's you know whether it's you know, finance, finance or whatever. <laughs> yeah. but, but presumably, you know, for the UK, there might be more investment into the UK, into I, I, more manufacturing. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really got into whether this is good or bad with you. I mm. mean, I'm just describing yeah. the process. I actually think we're going to end up with a better economy. It may not sound like it, mm. <laughs> but I think if you look at the economy we've had over the last 15 years since the global financial crisis, it's been disastrous. Yeah. You know, we've had the worst decade for productivity that we've ever had. 
Now, when you say that about the That's UK... That's where John and I entered the workforce. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Explains a lot. Explains a lot. 2003, <laughs> 4, then it's all gone downhill. <laughs> but the thing about that is, you know, the UK actually has decent stats on productivity going back centuries. So when we say this is the worst decade in 150 years, it means something, you know, yeah. since the Industrial Revolution. So something went profoundly wrong with the UK economy. And a big part of it was just this sort of perma-lukewarm economy zero interest rates, mm. this disastrous policy mix. You know, the idea that you could do austerity and then offset that with QE, something that does absolutely nothing for the real economy. You could decimate parts of the North, but it would be fine because you could offset it because by swapping one government liability for, for another. another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah. But it gave you, you know, when, that, when you had interest rates at 800 year lows, it was sort of screaming to you, this policy mix is really messed up. Mm. And and I think that's the reason productivity was so bad because mm. we had this lukewarm demand, but also we had an environment where nobody needed to invest because lo- most companies could just be dependent on cheap workers and cheap borrowing, and so you had you, you had sort of the superstar companies, mm. you know the big companies, particularly in the US, who were doing the investment mm. and were becoming very profitable and were making huge amounts of cash. But the, 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 any of the benefits of technology were not diffusing to the wider no. economy. Mm. And so if you push the economy harder yeah. because you have a better policy mix, you have fiscal being much more activist and central banks trying to offset the impact of fiscal you know, loosening rather than tightening, then I think you're going to get a, an economy that mm. actually works a lot harder. And actually, we've talked about you'll get the talk, benefits. I mean, we've spoken about these zombie companies that essentially have market share that are operating on wafer thin margins and cheap yeah. debt. And we've said for a long time, you know, actually a better economy and a better environment with real rates gets rid of those bad companies. Yeah. And and you know, actually forces those people to do something more productive. Or mm. just, it, it, it's when it, just, I, I think it, I think the big impetus is on investment. You know, you, you had no investment, no productivity. Yeah, yeah. The technologies exist. <clears throat> and so, you know, if you can actually force companies to actually invest rather than just hire another cheap worker because there won't be yeah. any workers, mm. then I think you're going to get a much more uh, sort of, it, it will be inflationary, but it won't be disastrous. You know, I said 2% is a, is a flaw. But it's not like we're going to be running six, seven, eight percent inflation. Mm. I think we're going to be running a, a more healthy economy. And yes, you'll get higher interest rates. But I think the point, you know, investors look at this and they think, oh my God, this is a disaster. You know, some labor power coming back, you know, after sort of decades. Margins of getting decimated. Yeah. And there's an element of truth in that. But really, it's about a certain type of investment not working anymore. Because, you know, in the 10 years that you guys have been working, you didn't need to be particularly smart to make a lot of money because you just put your money into US tech and you watched it get re-rated and you felt like a genius, right? We're talking about a world where actually there will be investment opportunities and you need to think, well, what are the things that are going to drive the economy over the next five, 10 years? How do I get exposure to those? How do I benefit from, you know, climate change, decarbonomics? How do I benefit from deglobalization? reshoring all of that stuff you know mm. where are the investment opportunities in that world rather than just putting your money into tech stocks because they're not going to get re-rated anymore i mean to be honest i think it's a really healthy landscape because particularly this year when leadership's been so narrow you know you've only wanted to own a handful of companies are actually investing properly and looking down the market cap scale and, and being a bit more innovative with thinking mm. i think that's I think that's far healthier in terms mm. of running a portfolio. It's yeah. having the magnificent seven. Um, well, we all wish we just had the seven at the start of the year. Of course, we didn't. We were slightly broader than that one, we Jonathan. Were. But and it's uh, it's the return. So it's the return of macro. So macro is relevant again, which is quite useful for me. Quite useful for guys. a head of macro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. And yeah. it's the return of value. So you know, if you look at growth versus value, and you can get this data going back to the 1930s, the 2010s is really weird. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. that period where growth just completely kills value, that hasn't happened in any other period. You know, there, there's no other decade like that. Mm. And, um, you know, the reason for that is that we just had zero interest rates. We had QE mm. and we had this constant re-rating of yeah. uh, growth because growth was scarce. Mm. Mm. You know, if you're in an economy where interest rates are zero and growth is quite scarce, then, yes, you move out to these mm. sort of long duration companies i just but i wonder that starts to shift yeah i mean we, we talked a lot about structural change and that's fine and we, we talked to the start about 
cyclical shifts in the economy, higher rates, having a recession, etc. Yeah. I just wonder whether the, the leadership of the Mag 7, as we now know them, which is a horrible phrase, um, whether that is in itself a slightly defensive trade, because these businesses have had an amazing ability to pull levers, yeah. to maintain margins, to cut yeah. costs, and and still grow at 10, 15, 20%, whatever the numbers are. Yeah. And if investors think that if they're using traditional business cycle analysis, as you pointed out, and saying rates up, Phillips curve, uh, yield curve inverted, yeah. can have a recession, yeah. I'm going to pile into the thing that's still likely to grow and be slightly defensive, yeah. then maybe that's where the leadership has come from or why. Yeah, no, it makes sense. <clears throat> no, I think it makes sense. They, they, you know, they have that sort of defensive characteristic mm. in that sort of world. And if you look at the sort of Russell 2000, it's down 30% since the yeah. peak. So that's an economy exposure. So I think that has been the sort of recession play. Mm. And so, you know, as a, in everything I wrote about the super cycle, you know, with that, I was trying to look through the distortions and say, okay, well, we'll have a recession, but it's very likely to be an extremely mild recession mm. and not the sort of recession that people imagine when they see the word recession. And if you look through that, is there something different that's beginning to appear on the other side? And that's where I think that sort of, you know, ideas about commodities mm. and super cycles and that, that's where you get a different type. And this is almost like the last hooray for those, for those parts of the stock mm. market. I think. Mm. Well, we've got a chart here actually for um, um, a rolling 10 year return um, yeah. of commodities. And, and you can see it's pretty cyclical. And we had a super cycle ending 2008 yeah. that was built around the old BRICS acronym. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Yeah. Um, we had one in the seventies, clearly, when we had high inflation. Yeah, uh, and we had one around the Second World War. And and, and you know, the last ten years, it's fair to say, has not been a good time for commodities. And and for many of the reasons that we've discussed, you know, we've not had a lot of investment by businesses because yeah. they haven't needed to because the, the demand hasn't been there. But um, we do another mountain pass. We do. We do another. Yeah, so and that's I'll um, be up for the next. Be so up I, for the next I peak. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that you know all of the themes that we're talking about are sort of positive for for commodities. Mm. But there's another part of this, which is the, the term premium, which has been, you know, the big sort of theme for investors the recently. Month. Yeah. Because it started to move. And I think that um, you know the natural inclination of investors is to say with the term premium is starting to go up, that must be because of fiscal policy. You know, and so they're looking at net issuance, netting out QE and all of that stuff, QT. And um, I don't think it's really about that. I think the term premium is about macro fundamentals. And I think, firstly, it's about the uncertainty around inflation. Mm. And I think compared with a few years ago, the uncertainty about inflation has clearly gone up. But the really big thing that always seems to be forgotten is the relationship between bonds and equities. Because, you know, we've lived, in, well, it's on that chart, yeah. So we've yeah. lived in a world since the, uh, since the early 2000s where the bond equity correlation has been this beautiful Beautifully negative, negative correlation. Yeah. 60 40, so, absolute dream. And so that's meant that bonds have a natural insurance property. Mm. So as an investor, you should be prepared to pay an insurance premium for something that is going to give you that degree of insurance. And the reason for that is that inflation was always pro cyclical. So you had an economy that was only getting moved around by demand shocks. So we had a series of asset price bubbles. We had central banks moving interest rates up and down, and that was moving the economy. And so if you only have demand shocks, you only have pro-cyclical inflation. And if you only have pro-cyclical inflation, then you have that negative bond equity correlation. Mm -hmm. And when you have that negative bond equity correlation, you should have a negative term premium. That's the insurance price of holding bonds. Now, if this world I'm describing is one where you get more, th more frequent supply shocks, then I'm not saying the bond equity correlation is going to be positive all the time, but we're going to get more periods like the last two years where the bond equity correlation has been positive. And that mm. means on average, even if most of the time the correlation is negative, because you've still got demand shocks, you know, most of the time, through, yeah. on average, uh, that correlation is going to be weaker mm. than it has been. And if it's weaker than it has been, then it means that the term premium has to go up. Mm. And that's a fundamental driver. You know, I haven't mentioned QE apart from to take the mickey out of it. <laughs> I haven't mentioned QT. And I think that, you know, the, the latest increase in the term premium coincided with the oral shock. And I think people were starting to think, well, maybe this is a slightly different world mm. where, you know, we're going to get more frequent oil price shocks. We're going to get more frequent supply disruption. And it's only just, and it's taken a while. And if you look at the term premium in the 80s, you know, we had this big collapse in inflation volatility through the 80s. It took investors a long time to, to realize, realize the world had changed. Yeah. 
and the term premium stayed really stubbornly high mm -hmm. because, you know, quite frankly, if you've been completely hosed on your bond position for 15 years, you don't want anything to do with bonds. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had the reverse of that over the past mm -hmm. two years, which is that every opportunity, because bonds have been so fantastic for so long, yeah. everyone's wanted to dive back in. Yeah. And, 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 and that sentiment is beginning yeah. to change. And arguably guilty as charged, like having been in my career a period where bond yields have most of the time been sub three if not even lower and zero for quite an yeah. extended period of time you look at a guilt with a three or a four handle and you, that's amazing compared to you know but but if the world has changed maybe that's not so clever after all and yeah. and um you know in terms of our kind of our positioning that really matters hugely bonds are a useful relatively short dated bonds at the moment yeah. are a relatively useful hedge i'm not sure i'll be rushing out to buy 30-year treasuries and 30-year yeah. gilts because mm. you are taking on a little bit too much inflation risk and so if this world premium, comes apart. So you've just, you know, you just explained why the term <laughs> premium should yeah. rise in that in that world. Yeah. And so, so the, you know, the, the 60, 40 starts to break down. And as an investor, you think, well, what I need is something that's going to protect me in those periods where inflation is counter cyclical or where you've got stagflation. Mm. And so you think, well, the supply shocks, what's going to be the source of the supply shocks? Most likely commodities. Weather mm. and so OPEC and war and yeah. Exactly. So yeah. let's cut the weight of bonds and let's increase the weight of commodities mm. or bits of the equity market that are exposed to commodities and mm. energy. There's a different way to play it. So the UK market, which has got Just a little BP shell in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're changing you're changing your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think is is the lesson. Because I think that's the interesting the interesting point that you made, I think, is about the eighties and how it took investors so long to realise mm -hmm. that the seventies were behind them and that we were entering it was a new paradigm, but you know, yeah. a very new environment. And I think we're all kind of wedded to we've all got recency bias inbuilt in us, yeah. guilty as charged. So Well I think how many people have only worked in that sort of yeah. market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that there's definitely been, you know, I mean in our client base, there's definitely been a generational divide. Mm. You know, because anyone that remembers the 60s and 70s was convinced inflation was coming back. And anyone younger than that yeah. was just like, what? what? what, are you, what are you <laughs> well, I think there have been so many false dawns, haven't there? Yeah. That, that was the, I think that was part of it. And when it did start to come back, and then you've got central bankers who are supposedly the ones to listen to and to guide us, saying it's transitory. That was the Well, the, the irony, <laughs> I think the irony of central bankers is that, you know, for 30 years, they took the credit. You know, they said yeah. the reason inflation is coming down is because of us. You know, we're so credible, we're so brilliant, we've got it sorted. You know, I, I, one of the last seminars I ever went to at the Treasury before I went, it was sort of 2005, 2006, it was called Macro Policy, We've Cracked It. <laughs> <laughs> the hubris of that, you know, it was the idea that they'd actually solved it and, that, you know, we didn't need to worry about macro policy anymore. And, um, you know, and I think for central bankers, if you if you read central bank speeches on globalization, you know they will tell you, well, it's not really a big factor, you know, because it's a relative price shock. Do you remember that? It's yeah. a relative price shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they could offset the impact of the goods deflation by inflating services, inflation, yeah. but they couldn't, you know, and we and we saw, you know, for a long period that they couldn't do that. Yeah, and so it, they're now they, they've been in this sort of the, the positions flipped because now. Inflation is going up for reasons that have nothing to do with them. And the macro environment is changing for mm. reasons that have nothing to do mm. with them. But, you know, this time last year, they began to panic that they were the ones that were going to get the blame. Mm. It's funny you mention the commodity, um, you know, commod more commodity volatility, because I've been reading that a number of the very big hedge funds have been um, employing sort of weather experts to try and predict We're need them. weather patterns. Well, weather expert or economist, you know, <laughs> it's an obvious joke. Um, <laughs> my, my, family or, my, my, my family are farmers, so based on this conversation, I know they <laughs> dust off my uh, But when my you say commodities, you're talking genes. about everything from soft commodities to... I, I think you, you it's, it's everything, uh, but it's particularly anything that could be a beneficiary of mm. new supply chains and decarbonisation. Because, of course, mm. on the other... So metals is the obvious one. Yeah. You know, but then on the other side, you've got... You've it's got the elephant in the markets. room is China, who's probably not going to be buying the same quantity of metal as yeah, they're, it has they're, done. They're, I mean, well, I don't think we're going to get some sort of massive Chinese crash, but I think that the Chinese, Chinese economy is not going to be growing at 10% a year no. anymore. You know, it's going to be so you've naturally to got two, less three. demand from there for things so like iron or less demand from there. 
But you know what we're looking at is a massive investment boom, private and public, yeah. over the next five ten years, and I think that puts enormous pressure. I mean, just look at the the, the sort of needs mm. you know for metals. Mm. If we're going to decarbonize, I mean, it's enormous. Have we got yeah. it in here? We had a chart um, showing the underinvestment in metals, didn't we? Uh, we don't have it in here, no. But I know the here. one you mean. But essentially, it show it, it sort of shows the amount of the amount of investment going into um, into new mines and exploration yeah. and things. And it's just, I mean, it's not an all time low, but it's it's really troughed. So yeah. I think you know, as yeah. demand does pick up for things like, you know, copper. I mean. In an electric car, isn't there two miles of copper wiring needed yeah, or something like something that? Like so, you know, you are, you know, as you say, as you, you know, the world electrifies it. You know, semiconductor. I mean, mm. the whole thing is. There's talk of Tesla buying lithium, yeah. Yeah. wasn't there? In yeah, they've Africa done a deal with someone. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think we, we're going to get this, this enormous investment boom. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that does mean, you know, bigger debt and deficits from governments and all that stuff. But, mm. I think it's the, the macro that's driving this. I mean, that's mm. massive geopolitics in terms of trying to control certain yeah. mines and certain areas. And yeah. I guess that's why China's been investing so much into Africa to try yeah. and control deposits. And, mm. um, yeah, this is, the, you know, I think that um, you know, that, whole, that whole Friedman thing of, you know, inflation is always and everywhere, monetary phenomenon. It's mm. not. It's about politics. It's mm. about power. Somewhere along the line, economists forgot about that. But when you look at these very long super cycles, they're about, they're about the sort of basic relationships, basic power relationships in, in the economy. Maybe that's a good headline for my quarterly letter. Inflation is power. There you go. It's a good headline. <laughs> Inflation is about power. Yeah, that's that's one of my that's one of my I'll mottos. <laughs> the other one is the tangible twenties, which yeah. I know that you're you're you you're quite, you're quite liked. Yeah. Mm. The only that's only I've been trying to make that catch on for the last three years, and and I've seen it once in a in an investing in wine advert, somebody pinched it and said, this is the way the tangible 20s are coming. And you wine invest tangible? In wine. I'm not sure it's quite that tangible. I don't know. But, um, Maybe. But that's, that, that, I think, is another way of looking at this because the 2010 was all about intangibles, you know, mm. tech companies and long duration. And Intellect, that stuff. Intellectual property, essentially. And um, this is about, you know, manufacturing coming back, commodities coming yeah. back, getting exposure to those parts of the economy. And you know, value like investing, yeah. tangible twenty. Yeah, I like it just that. won't catch on. Apart from with wine companies, I've been trying, I've been pushing <laughs> it. So inflation is about power, tangible twenties. There we are. More on risk it. premium. <laughs> what, I mean, what more do you want? <laughs> I got cash rates. That's very central. <laughs> Um, yeah. Dario, I think our time is just about done, yeah. but that's been really interesting. To look at both the short term cyclical issues and the kind of long term structural stuff, which we've touched on a bit before in the mm. podcast. And that's really fleshed we could, out. We could keep speaking. We could keep hours. doing this. Is, this has been honestly absolutely superb. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. Right. It's yeah. brilliant. So, thank you yeah. for your time. We need to get yeah, you back for you. in time for bedtime and all that jazz. <laughs> not my and, bedtime. Uh, not your bedtime. <laughs> no, it's time for my bedtime, though. But. Um, <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon and uh, any questions then let me know jonathan.raymond at quiltachievia.com and we hope to see you next time. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.